So the other day, somebody wrote me on Twitter and told me that they are working on a buffer overflow challenge, but they ran into some issues. Luckily, the person sent me a screenshot, so I was able to see what was wrong. It's again one of these annoying issues that you might not think that that's the cause, but that's why providing the technical information and sharing the screenshots and sharing the details shows it immediately. And I thought that's perfect to show you a typical pitfall that you might run into, which can be very, very confusing when you just start out. And we can combine this with just some additional tips and tricks for working with Python when you develop these kind of opponable exploits. The person was telling me that for some values, the values appeared on the stack, but some others didn't. And then I looked at this. The person highlighted here the issue. To the left, you can see here a binary string. It looks like a typical, I guess, stack address, at least without ASLR. It's, it's hex encoded, so you would hope you get the raw bytes out. But to the right, you see an output from GDB, including the stack, and you can somewhat see the values. Of course, you have to look here at the proper endianness. So this is interpreted as an integer. Here's the raw bytes. So here's the new line, which is fine. A print adds a new line at the end. Then comes the 00, zero the 7f. But then you would expect ff, but it's not there. You see here a bfc3, bfc3. And when I saw this, this immediately clicked for me. I once made a video about recognizing patterns, that you should train yourself to identify patterns and being able to recognize them. And this is actually one of those patterns that when I look at them, I immediately know what the problem here is. We have here a Unicode encoding problem. So here I'm trying to print the raw byte ff. So obviously this is not a printable character and we see a question mark. Let's pipe this output into hex minus c to see what the raw bytes are. And we can see we get the ff, as well as a new line from the print. But this was Python 2. Let's see what happens when we try Python 3. C3BF, and this is exactly what we saw here, BFC3 or C3BF. Let's look at this without the hex dump. Look, it's a special Unicode character. Here it's like a Y with like umlaut dots on top of it. I don't know. Let's actually turn this string into a byte string by prepending the double quotes with a B. Maybe then we, are, we can use uh, raw bytes. And yes, that's kind of true, but see what happens when we print this. We print this, which might look okay at first, but if you piped it into hex dump minus C, you see that it literally uh, printed that and not the raw byte. And this is probably the main reason why so many people still use Python 2 for exploit development, because something like this is just so annoying, because we don't want to deal with all this encoding stuff. We just want to deal with raw bytes. And of course, you can do this in Python 3, but it's uh, just a little bit easier, quicker, and dirtier with Python 2. But let me also show you how you do that in Python 3. Of course, I have no clue how to do this, so I just Google. It was one of the first results. Why do you even ask me? Just Google yourself. And you can see here that you need to use the sys module and then access uh, std out basically directly and write to it. This is actually still pretty good advice. Let me show you what the sys std out is useful for even in Python 2. So here I'm using Python 2. I import sys, then I access the std out of this Python program with sys.std out, and then I directly write the raw byte string ff to it. And we get that. And when you compare this to print, you can also see that we now don't get the new line because print always adds a new line at the end. But if you directly access std out and just directly write to it, it will only write what you wanted. So be a bit careful with print and in doubt use kind of like sys std out route directly. So let's see if this also works with Python 3. We tried to write the string ff, but again, it got converted. And if you would try to write the byte string, then you actually get here an error because write expects a string and then all this uh, automatic conversion happens. So what you actually have to do is you take the byte string, but you write to the buffered std out. I don't know why, it's just how it is. And here it works. Now you were able to write the raw byte string ff. I mean, if you write an exploit, you can just write yourself a quick function that you don't have to use the whole thing. But you can see how kind of annoying Python 3 is in that regard. But oftentimes, you also don't really directly output to std out anyway. Uh, on typical CTF challenge, you interact with a socket. So you send raw bytes back and forth between a socket connection. And there you can work with uh, bytes anyway. You can see here in the Python 3 socket documentation that socket.send expects bytes as a parameter. So there you can just send the raw byte string. All good. A very typical programming issue then when you work with Python 3 is when you mix regular strings with byte strings. So here's a regular string, ABCF. I don't know why I went directly to F instead of D. 
it is what it is. And then we have the byte string here, prefixed with the B. That doesn't work. So how can you deal with this? Well, first of all, you can convert a regular string to a byte string by calling encode onto that string. And you can say that that string is a UTF-8 string, so you want to encode it into the raw bytes that represents this string in UTF-8. And then you get the byte string. And the inverse is decode, so you can call decode on the byte string and you say, these raw bytes, please interpret them as ASCII characters and give me a string that represents that. And of course, if you have a byte string that, for example, contains a hex FF, and you try to decode this as ASCII, you get an error because ASCII doesn't go up to FF. ASCII only goes to hex 7F. So you would, for example, have to encode it as UTF-8 in that case. Okay, that also doesn't work. You basically want to parse this byte string as if it is a UTF-8 sequence, but it's not a valid UTF-8 sequence because Apparently, UTF-8 can't decode the byte FF. It's an invalid start byte. And this is so damn annoying with Python 3, especially if you do the slow level stuff. Uh, generally, don't work with strings, okay? Uh, generally, always work with byte strings, especially when you work with these uh, raw bytes. It makes no sense to work with strings. Always work with raw byte strings. Let's cover some other Python basics that you should know of. So generally, working with Python, it really makes sense to have a virtual env environment. Just a quick reminder, I mentioned this in another video of mine. I link it up there. This is not creating a virtual machine or anything. It just creates isolated Python environments. That just means the dependencies are not interfering with different projects. So you can run your projects in a specific folder and you know whatever you install for that project won't affect the whole system or the other projects, okay? To set this up, simply Google how to set up virtual env and then whatever you have like Mac, Windows or Linux or whatever. So let's quickly do this. First, I'm installing uh, Python 3 pip. Why is this so slow? What the heck? What is happening? What are you doing? Are you? This whole machine is kind of frozen. What the heck is, what is it doing? God damn, I hate computers. Let's kill this. There we go. So pip is like the packet manager for Python modules. So let's install a virtual env via this packet manager. You just look up how to set this up on your system, okay? I'm just like uh, quickly just making this work here. Anyway, now we have virtual env. So what you want to do now is, so let's make a project and let's create the virtual environment. I called it venv, then it's always clear. And you can see here it created this folder venv. It's now in here. In here you can actually find a typical Python environment structure with bin, include, and lib. And now let's activate this virtual environment, which looks maybe a bit weird, but you know, just like dot, and then you uh, call the activate uh, program binary script, whatever, in uh, venv bin. And now you can also even see that the particular shell I'm using is indicating if you are inside a virtual environment. So now the path is basically set up to use, use the modules that are in here rather than the modules that are globally installed uh, on this machine. When you now execute Python, it defaults to Python 3 because you are now using uh, the Python that is included in, in that bin. And when you now do pip install, for example, requests, because that is a very useful uh, Python module. Then you can use it in your programs, you can import them. But when I open here a new tab, and even when I'm in the same folder, when I execute Python, see, now I still use the regular system uh, Python. And of course, if I would try to import requests, uh, it doesn't work, there's no module requests. So I can again enter that environment, basically just setting up all the paths correctly. And when I now go into Python, then now I'm in the Python 3 environment and I can import requests. So this is how you can separate your projects. And to get out of a virtual environment, you can just type uh, deactivate. Uh, let's create a second project to show you something else. So let me create a different Python environment. So if you check out uh, which versions I have installed with Python tap tap, I see for example here I have Python 2.7 installed. You can use minus p and specify whatever Python uh, runtime you want. 
and then create the virtual environment. And now it sets everything up to use that Python interpreter. It's now using Python 2.7. And we now go into that environment, set up all the paths. When we now use Python, we use Python 2.7. And now we have a 2.7 environment. And now you can install all the Python 2.7 modules that you need. So here I just installed also Python requests for Python 2.7. So here I've just opened that folder, that project two folder in Visual Studio Code just to show you quickly the hierarchy in here. So you know I installed uh, the requests module with pip install requests. And like I said, it's a typical Python project setup. Uh, so you, we can go in lib and then Python 2.7 and then in site packages. This is where all the installed modules get placed. And you can find in here the requests module. So you can find here uh, the code. Uh, I guess it it relies on get and post. So get and post is in our separate packages here. So here is get and it relies on query string. Okay, this is like a little bit of an annoying module. And then this relies on here on public. Um, whatever, you can see here all the source codes of the modules that you have installed. And this is also very, very useful if you run into, for example, an error message that you don't understand and Google is maybe not very helpful. You can just go in here and you can modify even here stuff. You can, for example, add debugging printfs and you can look at what the function expects as parameters and all that stuff. Don't be scared to look into source code uh, of these modules. Sometimes uh, if you can't figure out how to use it, reading the source code and maybe debugging it a little bit with just some additional prints can be very, very helpful. Now I know uh, virtual env is not like the cool shit nowadays anymore. I guess a lot of people are nowadays using uh, pyenv, simple Python version management. It's probably nicer. Uh, I don't know. I got used to virtual env. I'm just letting you know this also exists. Maybe go straight to this instead of uh, whatever I use. Whatever works for you. I don't really care. It works fine for me. A lot of Python programs also include a requirements.txt. You might notice that when you pull something from GitHub. And so this makes uh, running some Python projects online very easy. You clone the GitHub repository, you create your local virtual environment, like I showed you before, with virtual env or pyenv. And then you can simply call pip install minus r, and then you pass in the requirements.txt file, and then it will install uh, everything you want. And let's say you created your own project and installed all the dependencies. You can write out all your dependencies with pip freeze and write that into the requirements txt. So that's basically how you work with Python. And then I also should mention Pwn Tools, which is a Python module, specifically a library to create like exploitation. It has a lot of awesome features. I typically don't use it in my videos, mainly because I don't want to have this problem of making sure everybody sets up all the dependencies and all that stuff. This is extremely awesome, extremely helpful, and you are super, super fast with that. A lot of stuff that I code by hand is already done and better implemented in Pwn Tools. But it's easier to follow along if I don't use a dependency like this. But it's really, really useful for you to set it up and learn with Pwn Tools. There are a lot of different examples in here, and a lot of the solution scripts that you, that you can find in write-ups use Pwn Tools. If you ever see this line here from Pwn import star, then you know it uses Pwn tools. That's also why you shouldn't name your script Pwn.py, because then if you are relying on Pwn tools, you know, you try to import your own local file instead of the module, you know, it creates issues. And besides that, probably one of the most important Python modules that you will be using a lot, especially in binary exploitation, is the struct module. Struct can unpack raw byte strings into integers or pack integers back into raw byte strings. It can do a bit more than that, uh, but this is the basic functionality that we are using, and we can also specify the endianess. So if you, for example, want to uh, pack the integer 1234, hex 1234, into a 64-bit string, uh, then we can do it like that. And here you can see the raw byte uh, output. And you can also control the endianess with greater than or smaller than signs. So here I flip the endianness. You can see the byte order is reversed with a greater, si greater than sign before. Q is 64 bit or 8 bytes. I, capital I is, for example, an unsigned integer. Capital H is uh, 2 bytes. And capital B is a single byte. And obviously, this causes an error because uh, you can't pack this two byte large value into a single byte. For this, please always consult the documentation. It's all in there. Uh, you can define here the byte order, the greater than and smaller than that I showed you in little or big endian. That's the most important here. And then here you can see the different data types that it supports. Uh, the most important, I guess, for us are always unsigned char. It's just a, a raw byte. It has, it's one byte. Unsigned short. It's two byte, capital H. Unsigned int. 
4 byte 32 bit capital I. And nowadays, because you do a lot of 64 bit binary stuff, uh, you might often find yourself using capital Q, which is an 8 byte uh, unsigned integer. And of course, there are a couple of other things you can even do with floats and doubles um, and char strings. Um, but often you only deal with this uh, integer conversion. The reverse works similar. The reverse works similar. Uh, we need to specify what the type is that we want to unpack. And we say now it's a 64 bit string or 8 byte string. And let's just use this from earlier. Let's try this out. Um, now you can see it returns a tuple to access the first element of this tuple. We can, uh, we can just access it here with the uh, zero. But this is like a super large number. That's not kind of what we expected. Let's look at this in hex. And you can see here, one, two, three, four. So the endianness is a bit screwed up. So of course, uh, you can now also affect here again, you say, oh, the data, the raw bytes are in big endian, so please interpret this as a big endian integer. And now uh, it's correctly interpreted as one, two, three, four in hex. Um, it's probably also worth mentioning and shout out uh, Jupyter Notebooks. A lot of people work with it, uh, mostly, for example, in academics when you do data science or whatever. But it can also be very useful for CTFs in general when you are very just explorative with your scripts. You don't know exactly what your script uh, has to do yet. And then you can use a Jupyter Notebook to slowly like explore. Um, and so here I'm just like running an online uh, test basic version, but you can also install this uh, locally. Um, I don't want to go into here how this exactly uh, works, but basically um, you have here a Python environment. So you can, uh, as for example, assign here A, and I just have here an environment. B is A plus one. You know, I can write here Python code, and with Shift Enter, I can execute that, and now it's executed. And now, for example, I could access B here, or I could access A in here. Um, and I could go back and change, oh, I wanted this to be a three instead, execute that again, execute that again, execute that again. You know, so this is a very fun explorative way to work with, uh, with work, to work with scripts. It has a lot of amazing features with inline images, data visualization stuff, uh, Jupyter notebooks or IPython notebooks are extremely powerful, are used heavily. For especially like in academic uh, circles, but obviously it can be also very useful for CTFs because it's a very cool environment to develop your small scripts and programs. That's all I got for you today. I hope this kickstarts your Python stuff. Uh, always remember, read the Python documentation, get comfortable with them. It's super important to learn how to read the Python documentation. Always pay attention to Python 2 and Python 3. Obviously, Python 2 gets slowly deprecated, so you should be switching to Python 3 mostly. Get comfortable with Python 3. But I fully understand that for a lot of these exploit scripts, it's still like just easier and nicer to work with Python 2. So uh, be aware of that. If I see a single comment screaming at me that I still advocate for Python 2, shut up. <laughs> just kidding. But you know, I get it. I know it gets deprecated. We should be moving to Python 3, but it's a bit annoying, as I have shown you with a few of the examples. I mean, it just makes it a little bit harder for beginners, and that's a little bit unfortunate. I hope this uh, quick Python introduction helped you. You really don't need like a book or a course or anything on that. Just practice, just use it. And I hope I gave you enough pointers to find the stuff that you need.